1941, having lamented in the last year of his life the tendency of human civilization to kill itself with its own dagger. Nondolal Bose did not paint the horrors of war, famine, and partition. That was left to his younger contemporaries. There is, however, a deep sense of irony in his painting on Nopurna, which was created in 1943, the year of the Great Bengal Famine, in which three million people died. More than three decades earlier, he had painted a serene picture titled On Napurna and Shiva. Now, in a combination of tempera and wash, he created the haunting On Napurna and Rudra. On Napurna, who is seated on a lotus, holds a bowl of rice in her hands. Before her stands Shiva, reduced to a skeleton, holding a begging bowl. The painter's mood in the year of the Great Bengal Famine is captured in one of his letters. I have realized the following in a dream he wrote. Give up your attempts to find God. Go on creating what you like. You are an artist. Paint picture after picture. Shubhashtandra Bose was by now in Southeast Asia organizing the Indian National Army, which fought for Indian independence by mobilizing Indians living in Singapore, Malaya, Thailand, Burma, and so on. Indians in Singapore and the Malay Peninsula responded with great enthusiasm to his patriotic call. In late August and early September of 43, he tried to send rice from Burma to Bengal, which was decimated by, which was being decimated by a terrible man-made famine, and his offers to provide relief were nervously suppressed by the British in India. In November 43, he broadcast an appeal to Chung King. The Indian people, he said, really sympathized with China and the Chinese people. He reminded the Chungking government that as, that as president of the Indian National Congress, he had sent out the first medical mission to China as a token of sympathy for the Chinese people. And he urged Chungking not to send troops to India to fight against us on the side of the British. He tried to suggest that 1943 was not 1937 and that East Asia faced an entirely new situation. He looked forward to the day not far off when by means of an honorable peace, Japan would withdraw her troops from China. An unrealistic hope, given the recent history of Japanese atrocities in China, this wishful thinking about a rapprochement between China and Japan was evidence of a lingering faith in an Asian universalism being torn asunder by nationalist rivalries. In the end, Japanese art enabled the spirit of an Asian universalism to survive the depredations of Japanese nationalistic imperialism. After Indian independence was achieved, Nandalal Bose began to quietly and confidently celebrate the Indian countryside in his art, creatively drawing on the Japanese Sumie style. While it may be true to say that towards the end of his life, he returned to his greatest forte as a linearist, it would be an injustice to his genius to dub him an oriental artist by accepting uncritically Roger Fry's early 20th century dichotomy between the linearism of Eastern art and the plasticity of Western art. Nandolal, the master of lines, was equally adept at plasticity and tone. But more than that, Nandalal's artistic imagination aspired to what historians and cultural critics have variously called a different universalism or a vernacular cosmopolitanism. The idea of Asia and the spirit of Asian universalism were in important ways products of cosmopolitan pop zones created by passages across the Indian Ocean. In this sense, the continent and the ocean were not necessarily in an adversarial relationship, but provided different contours of interregional arenas animated by the flows of ideas and culture. A sociologist named Binoy Shakar, writing in the modern review in the 1910s, had stressed both sea lanes and land routes in creating what he called an Asia sense. By the 1920s, most contributors to the same journal were more enamored of the oceanic connections that spread Indian cultural influences to Southeast Asia 
and also the creative adaptation of these influences by the peoples of Southeast Asia. This is something that Tagore explored in 1927 in great detail as he traveled from Singapore to Malaya, from Malaya to Java, then to Bali, back to Thailand, to India. In my work, I have sought to make a distinction between two strands, a strand of cultural and political imperialism and a strand of a much more generous universalism that shaped early 20th century discourses on this subject. During the modern age, it has been a constant struggle not to allow the universalist aspirations emanating out of the colonized world of Asia to degenerate into universalist boasts and cosmopolitanism to be replaced by bigotry. The tussle goes on in new post-colonial settings. The outcome is yet uncertain, but the ethical choice before us seems clear enough. I began with a quotation from Tagore about what contributions Asia could make uh, to human knowledge, and this he did in Iran in 1932. At Hafiz's great graveside in Iran, the custodian of the cemetery had brought out a large square volume of Hafiz's Diwan and asked Tagore to open it with a wish and his eyes shut. Tagore had been agonizing about the blindness and prejudice that went by the, the name of religion and wanted India to be free of this terrible affliction. Will the tavern's door be flung open? Tagore read when he opened his eyes, and with it, the tangled knots of life unfastened. Even if vain religious bigots keep it shut, have faith that by God's will, the door will open. Now, religious bigots is a very inadequate translation of a Persian phrase, Zahir is me, but I could not quite sort of do better. That is, those who pretend to be religious but are not truly and deeply religious. So whatever the religious bigots might do to keep that door shut, by God's will, that door will open. And then on that glorious morning, the Musafir, the traveler, had a vision of Hafiz's <coughs> smiling eyes beckoning him from another distant spring. And Tagore had no doubt that he and Hafiz were long lost friends from a distant past. From Iran, Tagore had traveled to Iraq. And one day in Iraq, he indulged his childhood fancy by visiting a Bedouin tent. He was first served coffee, thick, bitter, black Arabic coffee. Then followed a large meal, uh, a feast, with the accompaniment of delicate music. Tagore and his male companions were deprived of the pleasure of watching a dance by the Bedouin women, which only Tagore's daughter-in-law could enjoy and later report on. But he was treated to a war dance by the men with whirling sticks, knives, guns, and swords. Tagore was just reflecting on how different his life, nurtured by the rivers of Bengal, was from the struggle for existence in the desert, when the Bedouin chief startled him with the language of universal humanity. Our prophet has taught us, the chief said, that he is a true Muslim from whom no fellow human being fears any harm. Tagore was given a wonderful reception in Baghdad, and many poets and intellectuals gathered to honor him. And once uh, the tide of Arabic poetry had ebbed, he rose to speak, and he talked about uh, Hindus and Muslims in India, and he asked his hosts to send the Prophet's message again across the Arabian Sea so that there could be peace uh, in the subcontinent between religious uh, communities. And I can do no better than conclude with the aspirational quality of a different universalism that was perhaps best expressed by Tagore in a poem painting signed Baghdad, May 24, 1932. I do this because you, know, you open the papers and of course you 
hear and read news about terrible violence all the time, bomb blasts, people getting killed. But here was a poem painting that was composed, which was titled Baghdad, May 24, 1922. It can be read and heard today as an exhortation to people across the globe to awaken and weave together communities and fragments into a larger and a more generous pattern of human history. The night has ended. Put out the light of the lamp of thine own narrow corner smudged with smoke. Put out the light of the lamp of thine own narrow corner smudged with smoke. The great morning, which is for all, appears in the east. Let its light reveal us to each other who walk on the same path of pilgrimage. Thank you very much. of how I look at Southeast Asia itself uh, as another form of Mediterranean and, um, and how the world is made of many Mediterraneans. Yeah. But the more pertinent debate is how Southeast Asia as a form of knowledge is quite different, quite different from Southeast Asia as a geographical entity. I think this is one uh, particular point that you want to try to make in trying to expose some of the uh, difficulties in uh, grasping the term Asia. But I also know that uh, uh, there is a classical notion of, uh, classical history notion of Asia, and a modern notion, uh, the modern history notion of Asia. I think it's useful to make those comparisons, I thought, because even though your emphasis was on the contribution of uh, the great scholar, uh, poet, writer, uh, Rabindranath Tagore, uh, but I thought that it would be good for us to give some reflection because we don't create this term Asia, probably it's Greece, probably somewhere else. Yeah. So, but what is more important to me is uh, in the process of uh, discussing the idea of uh, the contribution of Chandra, uh, the contribution of uh, Rabindranath Tagore, I think the notion of Asian Asia has been developed by three different strengths, one in India, uh, probably in China. Uh, Vivekananda was very uh, critical in creating that. And then finally uh, in, in um, uh, India, China and Japan. But while I would accept this argument, uh, almost a rosy picture that you give, the intermixing of art, the notion of philosophy and so on, I also remember that uh, uh, how two important wars gave this notion of Asia, a unity. One is the Russo Japanese War, where the Japanese won, even though it was only conducted for a couple of months, from uh, February 1904 to September 1905. Um, and then the other war, the Second World War, the idea of post-prosperity sphere, 